I'm in charge of welcome. So welcome to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for your patience as I struggled with technology to get in here today. Um, so we are here as part three of a four part Wednesday night series this month from the network um, to advance abolitionist social work or the NAASW. Um, the first three parts of this event series have been Instagram lives. Um, Wednesdays around this time. So if you're coming for a third installment or a second, thank you so much. If you're here for the first time, thank you so much. Um, also, make sure you check out the little link tree in our page for the event information for next Wednesday, which is going to be a conversation um, streaming through a Haymarket event next Wednesday at uh, 5 p.m. Eastern time. Um, called Is Social Work Obsolete? And it's going to be a really, really good conversation um, that you definitely do not want to miss. The recording will be available after the fact if you aren't available at that time live. Um, that's a little plug for that. So again, thank you all for joining us. Um, feel free to share, you know, comments, questions, um, your own perspectives in the chat as we're moving through this space today. Um, and with that, I'm going to pass it, uh, to Viv. Oh, thank you. Um, and we are going to introduce ourselves. Um, so I'll start us off. Uh, my name is Vivian and I, my work is I direct social work at the Federal Defenders of New York in Brooklyn, New York, covering the district of New York, which is Brooklyn, Queens, Law. Staten Island. Before that, I worked at the Southern Center, Southern, ah, Southern Center for Human Rights in Atlanta, Georgia, working um, not on the death penalty side, but on the civil litigation side. So um, supporting class action lawsuits against prisons and jails and state of Georgia and Alabama and um, departments of corrections and different entities uh, that are players in the criminal justice system. And then I started my defense social work life at the Bronx Defenders as my second year in social work school. And that's where it all began. I feel like that's where I learned. I learned a lot at every job, but that's where I definitely got my foundation. So I'll pass it, pass it over to you, Rosie. Of course. I Thank you, Viv. <laughs> and I actually didn't know that about you, that you started off at the Bronx Defenders, I did too, doing immigration. <laughs> I really, part of my, my beginning stages has been um, because of that during my oh, doing immigration defense there. And then I um, criminal defense in the public defenders of California. And so now I've transitioned out of that. I'm actually working um, for the UCLA prison education program where I'm still kind of doing similar work, um, but still a little different. And, um, but lifelong or in the immigrant rights and, um, and yeah, continue to do this work. Part of action. And I think we'll talk more about why we're investing. I'll leave it at that and I'll pass it over to you, Sarah. Awesome. Thanks, Rosie. Um, yeah, my name is Sarah and um, I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm born and raised in Minnesota and um, have been in New York City for about 10 years now, which is where I do defense social work. Um, I've worked in both criminal defense and in immigration defense as a social worker um, and got my introduction to defense social work through a chosen for me social work internship, my first year of social work school um, that I'll also talk about a little bit more in a, in a minute there. Um, and in addition to doing defense social work, um, I also work um, very part-time as a therapist. And so that's um, also something that informs sort of how I understand the way that I can, um, the way that I can kind of use myself and my skills in different ways that connect with my values. Um, and also really informs a lot of the perspectives that I bring to doing defense social work. So, I mean, I guess a part of this next question is really connected to this, right? <laughs> so, you know, whole conversation going around and talking a little bit about why we got into this work. 
So you want to start us off? If- yes, I would talk about that. Um, <laughs> we're just uh, like, we're all really feeling technology something today. I don't know what that is, but it's really with us. <laughs> far away from a router. Um, so I got into social work by not my own, I guess it was my eventually, but um, I didn't know what I was going to do, where I wanted to work in my second year internship work school. And um, I always thought that I wanted to do international social work because I wanted to travel. <laughs> Selfish. Uh, but I wasn't allowed to do that because I, at least at that time at Columbia, where I went to social work school, you were allowed to do international social work been out of the country so you know that a lot of people who did not grow up with access to leaving the country or things like that so I didn't do that but anyway somebody suggested that um that I go learn about defense social work and go listen to a panel people that were placed to work um, and so I did and on that panel was um somebody in the prosecutor's office somebody somebody who had been placed in the prosecutor's office who had been placed and other places and the person who talked about working at Bronx Defenders um, just talked about his work in a way that seemed it seemed like a lot of flexibility it seemed like he was making impact it seemed that he was working with people that were in other professions um, and it just seemed really interesting but also um, hopefully impactful for the people that Bronx Defenders so I said, okay, if you want to place me at Bronx Defenders, you can. And I did. I started there. And I just remember the first, um, yeah, is someone's microphone being moved? Or is there, that's in the chat. Or like if somebody's typing, it's not me. Uh, but thanks, Rough Freaking Wabi. Appreciate that. Um, so I remember that the second week of our orientation, we the arraignment. And we were going to watch arraignments for the day. And I had never been to an arraignment before. I had never, I've never, I, I had been on jury duty, I think, but I had never really spent time in a courthouse or anything like that. My own speeding ticket, but that's a different story. Um, and so I didn't have, I never saw this part of life in the world and had no idea. Um, and I just remember being extremely shocked and, if I had my mouth open the whole time, I wouldn't be surprised because I could not believe that there were hundreds of people coming through this building every day who had been arrested. And it was in the Bronx and it was black and brown people. And I'd never seen that, I'm calling it a vision, but it's not a vision, but I'd never had seen a, a picture even like that. I'd never, I didn't know. And it's, it was kind of one of those things that you, once you see it, you don't see it, you can't and I knew sitting there, I was like, this is as a social worker. And that's what I've done ever since. Rosie? Yeah. Or- I'm also going to do ask if we just mute our mics because it sounds like people are hearing some kind of feedback. So I don't know what's going on. I don't know if y'all can still hear it, but um, I'm going to go ahead and do that too. Sarah, wanna, or I can go. Yeah, you can go for it, Rosie. I'm going to work on trying to figure out how to mute myself on an Instagram live. <laughs> Top left-hand corner. <laughs> there you go. So I got into this work because it really comes just from a personal level, like survival, right? Um, I think for my family, we've been impacted by mass incarceration in many levels. Um, From my mom, who was incarcerated for some time in immigration detention center, to some of my aunts and uncles who are serving time in um, the criminal legal system. And so I've, as the formally educated or most formally educated person in my family, I've had to navigate that for some, you know, sometimes in some ways. And so it's kind of been a part of my journey. Um, And then I became, you know, to realize, I came to realize that this is, it's not just my family and it's affecting so many families and we're affected by many things at once. So it's not just one thing. Like for example, in my family, 
of immigrants or undocumented immigrants, it wasn't just, okay, we catch a case and you go to prison and then you get to come home. And it, it, it was more complex than that too, right? Um, some family members got deported. And so, um, and it's multi, it's so many layers all at once. And so in thinking about that, it just felt like this has been a part of my life's work. And so I continue doing this, not just for my family, but um, in, you know, in some selfish ways, I learn to help my family and become a better resource. But I also learn um, to become a better resource to the community that helped raise me. And so I continue doing this because everything I learn is to bring back into the community, um, not to be a gatekeeper of information or of resources, but to just, you know, be a better resource, the kind of resource that I needed and I couldn't find growing up as well. So um, I continue doing this um, and I do it from the bottom of my heart, as corny as that may sound, but it's something that I'm really connected to. <laughs> I'll send it over to Sarah. Thank you. Yeah, so I was thinking about this question a little bit before I logged on. I was like, how do I answer that? What brought me to this? Um, and I think that part of it starts with, so my dad was incarcerated before I was born. And then again, off and on in more recent years. But while I was growing up, I never knew him to be incarcerated during that time, but I knew that he had been. And he was really involved in, um, in like an informal capacity in a community that supported other people who were getting out and coming back. And so he would spend a lot of time, you know, kind of meeting with people in groups and helping people figure out um, how to apply for jobs, what kind of things that they had missed, stuff like that. And so I would hear things about that from him. And I knew that um, from his perspective and, you know, how he would talk about that and that he was my dad. It was like, oh, okay, so sometimes people have this experience and then we care about them. That's sort of how you navigate that. And um, when I was a senior in high school, um, my dad, who's a white Canadian, so had a very, very privileged experience in the ways that he was impacted by these systems, um, very, very privileged type of experience. Um, but he also had never become a US citizen because for him, the benefit for that would be voting. And then he already wasn't allowed to vote because of the conviction that he had. And that was sort of how he thought about it. And so he just never, um, he never naturalized when he would have had the opportunity. And then because of a set of laws that changed in 1996, he became deportable for something that had happened a long time ago and ended up being put in deportation proceedings in, um, when would that have been, like 2004. Um, and so he ended up being deported as a result of that, which was the way that I learned a lot about how criminal legal system contact also impacts people's ability to stay in the, to stay in the United States across a much wider range of immigration statuses than I had understood. And so um, that was part of my family's experience. Again, we had a very, very privileged experience of how those systems like interacted with us because we weren't targeted by them. Um, but like, obviously it was a very difficult experience and um, it's something that's still difficult for us in a lot of ways. And I definitely saw for my dad even how that experience of losing the community that he had really destabilized him in a lot of ways that led to him then having a lot of future contacts with the criminal legal system in Canada post deportation because he returned to behavior that's really harmful to other people. Um, in the next sort of like phase of things for me, um, when I was looking for a job after college, I knew that I wanted to do work that was directly with people that was about providing some kind of support. And I got this job in DC that was about kind of a, a blend of um, homeless outreach services and mental health services. Um, and I didn't realize what a unique job it was when I got it. And I also was like, oh, I must really, I must really be ready to do this work. And then the person that hired me told me that um, I had been a radio DJ in college and she thought that that was cool. <laughs> she was like, that seemed unique. I was like, that's really, I really thought I had something here, but no, <laughs> it's just random. Um, but in doing that work, I noticed that the the different things that so many people were navigating where we were providing support, the biggest response 
was through the criminal legal system. So people were just being arrested for all the different types of like struggle that was happening um, in their lives because of stuff in their families, because of societal structures that were putting people in certain kind of spaces, right? And the organization that I worked at took this approach of, if we're working with someone and they have to go to court, we always go with. And if the court wants to hear from us, we always say, what we have this person's back in the community. We're providing support. They're in touch with us. It's all fine. <laughs> kind of no matter what was happening, it was like, we're gonna pull up and provide that kind of support. And I didn't realize how rare that was. Um, I think until I got into social work school and started hearing a lot of other ways that social work and that social workers relate to legal systems, whether it's family court system, criminal court system, um, being people that are often part of evicting people from supportive housing placements and intersecting in that way with housing court systems <laughs> um, and, and immigration systems. So when I was finishing social work school, um, I wanted to do work that where I could be kind of a buffer between people and systems that are coming at them. And um, I've, found defense social work um, sort of through that, or I, or I landed in a defense social work job through that. Um, and I thought that I would do it for a year. I was like, I don't know. It seems really awful to work with lawyers this much. <laughs> um, the perspectives there are really <laughs> kind of messed up, but um, the I've been lucky to work in an organization that views social workers in defense settings not as mandated reporters and realized what a privilege it is to be able to work with people without that um, sense of you might not really be able to tell me everything um, coming into the picture and also realized how amazing it is to be in a social work job where it's never my role to report on someone to court and so many other jobs that work with people who are being impacted by these different legal systems or being preyed on by these different legal systems, a big part of your job is to report on people to court. And if you don't do that, you lose your opportunity to provide support. So those two things are often linked for social workers. And um, the, the absence of that, at least in my experience of defense social work, is what I have liked about it so much. So that was a much longer answer than I was sort of expecting <laughs> to give. Um, but I'm going to, um, mute myself now and keep passing it. No, Sarah, that was so good. Cause I actually really resonated. I know we're going to go into the next question, but I really resonated with that last part. The fact that we're not mandated reporters and we, you know, did, we don't lose that when you become a mandated reporter in some ways, you lose the opportunity to support because you have to um, report. And so part of the reason why I wanted to do defense social work was because I didn't have to do that and I could support the people I was working with in many other ways. So. Yeah, I thank you for pointing that out. Yeah, and I'll and I'll just clarify for folks too. So we're in New York City, and it sounds like in California too, at Defender Organizations, we are given this gift of not having to be mandated reporters, and that is not that does not exist exist in every state, even as a defender. So if you are a defender in another state, just definitely check your rules and laws about being a mandated reporter. But then also, once you know, you know, and you can start pushing back and fighting against it too, because it really, they don't go together. Um, and speaking of going together, <laughs> our whole conversation will be about things that go or may not go together. Um, but let's start off with definitions, I guess our own personal definitions of what, when you think about defense social work, what do you, what do you mean by defense social work? And um, Sarah, you wanna kick us off? Or was, I, was that for me to start? Sure, I can kick us off and we'll circle back, yeah. Um, I, to me, defense social work is social worker in the defense side <laughs> of legal proceedings and the I, I mentioned earlier, like the first internship that I had um, as my signed placement, my first year of social work school, it was in um, the juvenile rights practice of a legal services organization. And I saw that and I thought, oh, that's really cool. That means that I get to work with people who are being charged as juveniles in juvenile court. And that sounds like something that I'm really aligned with and interested in and what a cool opportunity. And then I got there and I found out that it was working with um, the 
lawyers that were appointed to children um, whose parents had an abuse or neglect case brought against them. And working with children has never been something that's super motivating to me, even though I love children in my personal life. <laughs> um, and I um, didn't want to to do anything related to you know foster care child protective work when i went to social work school and it was the only thing i wrote on my little form for internships i was like nothing foster care related <laughs> um and then ended up there and the the frame in that space was like forensic social work which some folks who work in defense settings like use that term of forensic social work um that's a term that i've heard used more broadly to also talk about social workers in prosecutors' offices, social workers in some of the programs that are inside of courts that have a goal often of seeing who can be um, kind of diverted out of maybe a criminal legal court, um, but are, are differently situated sort of in the court. And so um, to me, defense social work is very much about we are always providing the defense in whatever system um, the person that we are representing is being kind of ensnared in, attacked by, preyed upon by. Um, and it does not mean that there has not been real harm caused. It does not mean that there are not really, really complicated and difficult and damaging situations <laughs> that have unfolded. But I have always, always felt confident in being aligned on the defense side because the alternative response, whether I'm working in the criminal system, the family system, or the immigration system, which are the three spaces where I have experience, the alternative response will always only cause more harm and will not do anything to address whatever might have actually happened if there was real harm caused. Often there wasn't, sometimes there was, and I'm always comfortable um, working against whatever the state's solution is. And so I'll pass, we'll do, I'll pass to Rosie first and we'll circle back around to Viv. Yeah. And Sarah, I think you laid it out pretty perfectly, right? On what, what it would mean. And I think it means that to me too. I would also add that there's something about defense social work that also um, hum uh, allows people to be humanized or their experiences and their narratives. And we can add that to um, when people are going through their cases. Um, if we think about the legal field, it's it can be pretty, or it is really harsh. And we often just look at the law and the law says this, therefore you did this and therefore you are this. And so as part of, at least for me, coming from a holistic defense background, it's more than just this is what the law says and this is what you should be or this is what you're titled from now on, right? It's looking more and looking deeper and saying, well, this is what happened that led to this, right? And so therefore, this is still a person. Um, and so remembering and recognizing that the people that we are working with, despite or no matter what they did or what happened, they are still people. And so really bringing that home and um, and just humanizing and making this a humanizing and supportive process for people the best that we can. Thanks for both of those. Um, and I'll just add on to what both of you said, because I agree with both of you and Devine LH, thank you for your question. What are the systems again that folks are ensnared in? So Sarah named immigration, criminal defense and family defense for folks that are in the um, family regulation system. And I, now that I work in federal court and have been for almost 10 years now, woo, um, really see all, you know, the criminal justice system, any court system really as having, and I describe it as having their tentacles in every part of our lives and whether you, I don't wanna be the conspiracy theorist, but whether or not you feel it or you believe it or you think it, they really do. And whether or not you are involved in uh, causing harm to someone or committing a quote unquote crime, um, you're still impacted by these systems. You're still impacted by our court system. You're still impacted by the decisions that are being made in all of these court systems. Um, so defense social work to me is is same as what Rosie and Sarah said, and and I like to think also that we are educators, hopefully, to our clients and to court 
I'm going to say courthouse communities of everyone who's there, the judges, prosecutors, probation officers, pretrial officers, clerks, whoever is there. Um, I like to think that defense social workers educate all of those folks on many things. Um, sometimes it's the reality of the world. Sometimes the folks that are prosecuting or judging are completely disconnected from what's happening in people in the actual world. And so to bring them into reality of like, this is actually what's happening out there. Um, sorry to digress, but I remember during the beginning of the pandemic, there was a federal judge who wrote an article about how, oh, well, things are great from the bench. And it's fine, we're able to do this remotely and we're able to move through these processes. And someone from my office wrote an op-ed saying, basically, are you fucking crazy? Like, do you know what's happening out here to people who are impacted by the criminal justice system? It's not the same as what's happening to a judge. Um, so educating about reality, educating about um, things as, as micro as what is the benefit of harm reduction to how are people's lives destroyed by the family um, regulation system? Uh, excuse me. So I'm just going to add that as an educator in these systems of what, how people are impacted by the systems, how people recover or have to recover from these systems. And then to our clients, I, you know, as much as we are part of the system and sometimes a cog in the wheel, I do like to define my role as being in partnership with my clients in moving away from their experience in the system or from finding whatever freedom means to them or from moving beyond what the expectations have been for them in their lives. Um, so I'm just going to, I'll add that to those definitions. And I'll pass it back over to you, Sarah. Okay. I got unmuted. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to keep doing that. Um, yeah. I mean, so, so next we want to, we're going to move into this question of, where do we see abolition and defense social work overlapping? Um, and then also where do we see them disconnecting? And in moving into that question, if, if some of you follow this account and you've been looking, seeing some of the other posts that have been coming out this month during social work month about um, the survey on mapping criminalization and looking at what are all the places that social work fits into this web of system and structures that criminalize people and communities. And then what do we do with that? <laughs> and what do we do with that if we also um, want to be living out abolitionist values and are doing some sort of social worky work? And we ask questions in that survey, like, should social work and law enforcement collaborate, right? Um, and I think that a lot of the, the three of us who are on this call have a particular opinion about that and also were system players, or when we work on the defense team, we're system players. Um, Detention Watch Network is an organization that does a lot of really great work um, shedding light on what conditions are in immigration detention centers, um, part of the movement to abolish ICE, to abolish immigration detention entirely. And they recently put out a report that talks about um, reformist reforms and abolitionist reforms in the immigration context, which is a, a frame that I think comes out of critical resistance, um, who has a really great um, publication about reformist reforms and abolitionist reforms related to policing. And when I saw the Tension Watch Network, their first report about this come out, one of the things that they talk about were representation programs for people who are detained in immigration custody and how that legitimizes that system in a lot of ways. And I'm gonna kind of pull back for a second. Um, in immigration court, people do not have right to an attorney. So in criminal court, most places in the US now in family court, if a person's charged by that court system, um, you have a right to a free attorney if you cannot afford one. In immigration court, because of the type of court proceeding that it technically is, people don't have a right to an attorney. If you can find one, if you can pay one, you can bring an attorney, um, but you don't have a right to an attorney. And there has been a, a growing movement to provide public defender style representation to people in immigration proceedings um, in New York City. That's the New York Immigrant Family Unity Project. And that was piloted in 2013. Um, people at the local court here who are detained and put in deportation proceedings have access to free counsel on defense teams that involve more than just an attorney, that involve social worker, legal advocates, other types of advocates. And um, 
where am I going with this? So even from the perspective that I'm speaking from, as someone who's a social worker on immigration defense teams, there's ways that I recognize, yeah, we're being there in some ways legitimizes the system. And I'm comfortable making that choice for now, because I think one, it's really important to, to helping people access liberty, to helping people remain um, in this space where they want to live. Maybe that's because they have family that's here and the family should remain together. Maybe they don't, but it's the choice that they've made for themselves, right? Um, and it's a choice that people should be able to exercise. Um, and there's a way that I can do that work that perpetuates the ideas that the immigration court has about people who are brought before them in deportation proceedings and there's a way that I can do that work in ways that counter that. Immigration court is really focused on what are people's criminal conviction histories? What have people done that, make, that proves that they're bad? And then how have they proved that they're in the process of reforming or that they have reformed themselves? And so it can be very challenging. And I'm not saying that I have always done it in a way that I feel good about or that I will do it always in the future in ways that I feel good about. But for me, the struggle in, um, in doing this work, in doing defense social work is, how can I challenge the narratives that the system is perpetuating and provide good representation to people as they're being passed through that system? Um, the, the other thing that I want to say about this before I pass it, about how I see abolition and defense social work overlapping, when I talk about defense social work, I always say that the work is always focused on these two areas at the same time. And one of them is strengthening each person's chance at getting the legal outcome that they're seeking. And the other is to address the harm that's being experienced by each person over the course of that process, because that process always causes damage. And I think that being able to meet people in that space and being able to sit with people in those spaces as a social worker, the kind of support that I can offer, and the kind of processing that people are doing while those systems are coming down on them. I can help people get a better chance at the legal outcome. Often, we don't get it, especially in the immigration system. Even people with counsel are still deported about 65% of the time. So more often than not, people who we represent are still gonna end up being deported, not getting the legal outcome that they're seeking. Um, but we can, we can try and minimize the harm that that process causes. And we can provide space for people to wrestle with how they're being told to see themselves and who they know deep inside that they are. <laughs> um, we can support people in not having the, um, their ability to kind of care for themselves stripped from them by these systems because these systems really, really try to do that um, so that people also leave those spaces viewing themselves the way that, the, that those systems are created to make people feel about themselves because that's the way that those systems really replicate themselves. So um, I'm going to pause um, and whoever wants to jump in next, um, go for it and you can take on that question either of how you see abolition and defense social work overlapping um, and where you see them disconnecting either one. I see the disconnect when offices, many defense offices um, do not actively take on the role of abolishing prisons and jails. Um, so I think that public defense work is not inherently abolitionist, even though I think a lot of defenders think so. And the defense work itself, representing people in their criminal cases or whatever kinds of cases they have, is not about abolition. It's about that person and, and their case. Um, I think where you, where you get into movement lawyering, that's a little bit closer to abolition because people are using their individual cases to, to impact a greater number of people. Um, but even in civil litigation, like civil impact litigation that I did in the South, you know, we're working to improve conditions in prisons. We're working to improve the conditions of an indigent defense system, but we're not working to abolish anything really. Um, so that's where the disconnect is, is like, well, the job is actually not abolition work. It's, we're not abolishing anything. Um, 
But where they overlap or where they can overlap, I think, is if public defender offices did take that on as a stand. Um, if every defender who worked in the office was actively advocating for no jail time and giving all the reasons why, because the jails are messed up, because this is not real, true accountability for all the reasons that exist of why prisons and jails shouldn't exist, um, for all the reasons of why our legal systems should be abolished or changed or overhauled or whatever. Um, I don't think that individual defenders are doing that on an individual basis in individual cases for whatever reason. It could be that it's not the argument to make in front of this judge who will then take that out on our, on our client. Um, something like that. It's not for, you know, maybe, I don't know. I don't know what, where that sentence was going to lead, but um, that's where it overlaps from where it could overlap for me is if people were actually taking a stand on abolition and incorporating that into legal cases and incorporating that into sentencing. Um, there, I think there are things, you know, I'm not a lawyer, can't talk about, <laughs> can't give legal advice, but from what I've seen, there are, you know, and this is probably why I'm not a lawyer is like, I would be filing habeas on behalf of everybody. I'm like, this person needs to be out because of this reason. This person needs to be out because of that reason. Like everybody, we're going to trial on everything. No, no rest, no rest for anybody. We're doing this. Uh, but that's not always the best choice for every, for each individual person. And um, there's reasons why, and there's reasons why the lawyers make those decisions or not. Um, there was something else. Oh, what I was going to say is like where I think another overlap could be is if uh, defenders, including defense social workers, um, do what our clients ask us to do, even if it's not going to work out. So, you know, a lot of times in, in defense work, like I, now I hear uh, clients talk and, and ask, they, wanna, they want their lawyer to make an argument, uh, argument about racism in sentencing. And a lawyer will say no for whatever reason. But you know, your client's asking you to do something. If, if they want you to do it, do it. If you've explained what all the outcomes could be and how this judge might punish you for saying anything like that, you know, there's always an appeal process, but like do what your client asks you to do. To me, that's, that's being an abolitionist defense worker. Um, you're working on behalf of people who are incarcerated or impacted by the criminal justice system. So do what they want. Be led by people who are directly impacted. That would be another way for social work, uh, for defense social work and defense work to overlap is if we are actually partnering with our clients and actually actually listening to and being led by people who are directly impacted. I'll pass it to you, Rosie. First of all, yes, yes, yes to everything you just said. <laughs> um, but I think also for me, I mean, just to add on that part of being able to humanize um, the narratives and being there side by side with people. There's something special about that and allowing people to, I, I'm i not all for at all the whole like give voice to the voiceless. I think everyone has a voice and I think everyone has a way in how they show up for themselves. And it's how do we support that? How do we cultivate that? How do we uplift them so that they are heard, right? And so being able to do that for and with people, I think is where we can kind of see the overlap. I'm still more on the side that it doesn't <laughs> overlap because in the end, we are still a part of the system and there's only that we can do um, and that's why and that's where it gets really tough um, when doing this work um, but I think just being able to work you know, allowing people like come on you got this like if you want to say something say it you want to talk to your attorney or you're not listening and I, I talk to your attorney tomorrow let me know what you want to do we'll talk to them right and like or in court or you know whatever it is that person can have or tr at least try to have full autonomy over their own experiences um, and really push for their voices to be heard in these spaces where oftentimes we know they will go unheard. So, um, so thinking about those things, but I mean, for me, like, I just, I always think to the idea that I don't want this job. The goal for me is to work myself out of the job, right? Like hopefully this job won't, necessary and that this job will need to exist in our future and that's the goal as weird as it for people right because like yeah you put 
so much or you study so much to to do this but yes it's the point is to not have this job at one point right like that because we won't need this anymore um and so working towards that drives me as well um but i'm looking at the time and i think we can continue talking about this it's such a great conversation but I know. wait rosie yeah. before you take us to the next thing there's go, go, something go. that i do want to sneak in there okay the um and it's kind of a tack on to what to what you were talking about then with like when people are like this is the argument i want to make and then you make it there's a pl a place a way that i want to complicate that a little bit because there are times when people have said to me like or to me and their attorney together you need to make sure the judge understands that i'm not a criminal this i've seen this play out in criminal court and i've seen this play out a lot in immigration court because in the immigration system that like narrative is just hammered so hard on people and people are like okay great that's what i have to that's who i have to distinguish myself from and there's so many ways that like that that that's run through anti-blackness in that system so many different things are happening at once with that and in that space i think another way that it's imperative on us to be doing responsible work for each client and then for the people who will come after and then also to be off offering space for people to um, engage in their own kind of self-work or process of exploration is to ask people follow-up questions about what does that mean how should a criminal be treated like i'm not a criminal they shouldn't treat me like one what is a criminal how should criminals be treated and i've never yet asked somebody that question that wasn't very very quickly like oh i don't want my enemy to be treated the way that i'm being treated by this system and kind of break down what that means. Um, but I wanna, yeah, I just, that was sticking with me a little bit to kind of complicate that because it's not, I don't think that people have a duty to do that kind of work with their defense team at all. And sometimes people have internalized messages so much that that's also what people want to use to see if it can save them um, in a moment where again, the system is coming down on them and, um, and navigating that is another layer of complexity that can enter into the work. Yeah, thanks for adding that. I think also just really quickly, <laughs> people in the criminal legal system is like, we're returning citizens, we're citizens, so we be we deserve to be home. But then what does that say for people who are documented, right, and are also in the criminal legal system? So, um, yeah. so yeah, so I'm sensitive to that on both yeah. ends. And there are other ways in which this overlaps with other systems as well, but I think those are two big distinctions. Yeah, and defense strategies in, in criminal court are often about, well, if the state had stepped in and protected this person from their parents who were so abusive, <laughs> then this mm -hmm. wouldn't have happened years later, right? And so again, how do you engage in defense work that can be effective for that person and that doesn't attach to narratives of other systems that are also harmful to people, to often the same sets of people <laughs> or the same person just at a different juncture in their journey um, and it, yeah, it's, um, it's difficult to do that. And like I said, I don't think that that's something that I have always done responsibly at all. And I don't, I think it's something that I will like continue to struggle with and that I'll mess up in the future. Um, but I think that's the biggest task that ideally all defense teams and defense social workers would take on. And that I think is also really important if we want to do as much as we can to bring an abolitionist lens into this type of work. Okay, now really moving us for real, for real. Last question, ready at a time. Uh, how do you practice, and what other ways do you practice abolition? So the theory and then also putting it into practice, what does that look like for you? Well, I'd say just continuing on with what Sarah said, I mean, some there's different starting points for everybody. Um, I mean, just to continue what you're saying, like language is a big deal. And so what you were talking about, like disparaging one family member to help our client or disparaging people in that person's family or community to help our specific client um, is one way to do that and to do use people-centered language, which if folks out there don't know what that means, it's not using words that are typically used to describe people who have been involved in legal systems. So not using, and I don't use these words other than to tell you not to use them, but not even using defendant, not to use accused, convict, ex-convict, 
uh, any of those words, uh, prisoner, uh, inmate, all of those words. Um, so you're using person or incarcerated person, returning citizen, directly impacted person, or the person's name. And that's one starting point for everybody that everybody can do. Um, personally, um, I'm trying to figure out right now, like what I can do that's not like in my mind, I feel like I'm, I'm talking shit all the time. And that's like one abolitionist thing I'm doing. But the other thing that I'm, I've been trying to do is, you know, I'm, I'm a defender and a lot of defenders are anti-prosecutor, anti-whatever, you know, anything that's anti, that's, we're fighting against, we're anti. And not that I'm trying to have coffee or dinner with anybody, but I really am trying to see people as people in the courtroom and trying to address people like people and explain my perspective in a way that's not so adversarial, but like, I don't really understand what you're talking about prosecutor, but let me tell you what I'm talking about and why I understand it the way that I understand it to be. Um, I don't understand your language probation officer and why you would put somebody in jail for testing dirty, but let me tell you where I'm coming from and how I see this person who I've spent hours with when I know you've spent 30 minutes once a month with. Let me tell you what I know about this person. Um, and so I, that's kind of what I'm thinking about and, and trying to figure out is like, I don't necessarily want to align myself with the values of other people that I work against, but I need to know how to talk to people and convince them um, and persuade them and possibly change their mind about the, this entire system. And that requires that I be very much my authentic self. So when I'm showing up to court or when I'm in the elevator with any of these folks or when I'm on the phone or when I'm with my client, um, respect is cool uh but like being true to yourself and saying what you want to say you're not going to get punished you're not going to get like in a way that also doesn't fall on your client of like now your po is going to treat you like crap because of whatever i'm not talking to anybody like that i'm talking to them like another person and i'm addressing them in a way that i also want them to address my client and see them in that way um so i guess that's like I don't know if it's parallel processing or I don't know if it's doing by example, but I'm trying to be the person that I want to see in other people. And I'm also trying to convince them. And so how do I, I'm asking myself, how do I convince people that abolition is what we should be working towards? And that's by treating other people in the community um, with love and trying to understand the perspective, but also not agreeing with people and not going for the okie doke and not being like pretending to be this person that I'm not like a robot or a, you know, just because I'm in a courthouse, I have to behave a certain way. I'm going to be myself um, from my shoes to my head. So, <laughs> so it's sneakers in the courthouse. It's what I, you know, it's comfort. I'll pass it to Rosie. Yes. And you were talking about language, which I think is really, really important. Um, there's, a open letter that was written by Eddie Ellis from the Center for New Leadership. Um, everyone should read that. You can just type in um, language letter, Center for New Leadership, or put Eddie Ellis and it'll pop up. It's definitely something that um, we also use at, you know, at the UCLA Prison Ed program too, where we talk about language. So that it just reminded me of that, wanted to drop that resource. But for me, also thinking about the ways we interact with one another, um, is also a part of that in how I um, practice abolition within myself, right? And like how I take care of myself or preserve myself, how I interact with, in relationships with my community, um, with my peers. Um, so that kind of thing is also a part of that, you know, change starts starts with the smallest of things. And so taking into consideration of you know, taking that into consideration. And um, I lost my train of thought. So I'll pass it to you, Sarah, because I'm more pressed for time at this point. My phone's about to die. <laughs> <laughs> Technology issues for us continue today. Um, but I mean, this is, I think, kind of building on what you're talking about, Rosie, but thinking about how do we treat one another and how do we engage with one another? Like, Miriam Kava talks a lot about abolishing the cop in our head and our hearts. Um, and when I think about, okay, how am I showing up in my workplace? Um, I'm a supervisor in my workplace now. Um, what are the structures around decision making that I'm reinforcing? Um, what are the ways that I'm doubling down on hierarchy? 
um, looking at that and um, bringing an abolitionist lens to that and thinking about what are the ways that some of those things can be deconstructed, um, thinking about the ways that um, like a desire for punishment and retribution are playing out in the workspace and in conflict that we are having with one another in the workspace. Um, I think that in, I, I work somewhere where we work in four different court systems and you can kind of see how in each practice area, like we are struggling with internalizing some of the stuff that comes from those different court systems and then acting that out on one another. Um, because it's really difficult to sit in those spaces and to like take that in all day and to, to not do that. <laughs> um, and so having space where we can talk about that, um, seeing what kind of ways to address like conflict um, that happens in the workspace, um, I think is related to that. And um, I'm also kind of like playing around with this idea right now of like in these court spaces, it kind of this idea is pushed forward that safety is a finite resource. And that if some people have access to their liberty, the rest of us won't be safe. And that some people have to be in these kind of suffering boxes far away so that the rest of us can be safe and really view safety as this kind of zero sum game. And thinking about the ways that that um, kind of false narrative about finite resources, about zero sum games plays out and even how we think about like what workers should be paid, how people should or shouldn't have time off, um, whether we should or shouldn't be able to rest. Um, I think that's also an extension of the kind of abolitionist lens of what is it actually that we're building towards. And um, if, we, if we can't believe that it's okay for us to rest now, are we really building, how are we building towards a space where we want everyone to have access to rest? And there's tensions that come with that. Um, but that's one other space where I sort of see that. So um, we, we do have a couple minutes left. I mean, we can turn a little bit to questions if there's um, questions that folks want to put in the chat. Um, if not, that's also okay. Um, I think we want to take this chance again to remind folks to check out the link in the Abolitionist Social Work um, bio for that event next Wednesday, the last of the series for the month on the topic of is social work obsolete. Um, we'll also have a fuller report back from the survey that we, um, the survey process we engaged in last year about mapping criminalization um, that'll be coming out towards the end of the month. Um, you can see a couple of different posts that share some quotes and responses that people shared um, engaging with those questions. Um, anything um, final from either of you before we thank everybody and log off for today? Yes, I would like to invite everybody, um, if you don't already observe court, to go observe court in any court that's public. So that could be your criminal state court, state criminal court, that could be your federal, you don't need credentials to be a defense social worker you probably just need a social work degree but to be a mitigation specialist in defense work this is for case 747 you do not need a social work degree so mitigation we as defense social workers we do a lot of mitigation that's part of our job but there are specific private mitigation specialists or mitigation specialists in defender offices that don't require a social work degree um so just look up like criminal defense mitigation specialist and you'll find information about there about that um so i just wanted to add court watching Court watching is great for learning about what's happening to people in court, um, learning about the laws that are trickle down to everybody um, or up, uh, learning about who the judges are in your district or in your county or in your community and what kind of decisions they're making. Um, so that's my invitation is to find out where your district federal court is and find out what's public and go watch it, even if it's arraignments. Uh, or find your state, your local state court or county court and go observe court. You can walk, I can't remember if you can watch immigration proceedings. I know I've seen them, but not being a part of them. But um, I don't know if those are public, but almost all courts are public except for family. Um, but I'll, I'll leave it to, for Sarah to talk about immigration court. Yeah, immigration court is technically public, but they do a lot to not let you in. <laughs> um, and right now, most of that is still happening um, virtually, but in, um, if you're in New York area, follow Abolish ICE, New York, New Jersey, um, and or check out New Sanctuary Coalition that does a lot of immigration court support when that's happening in person. 
and Ann Acorn, um, Zoom Court is really, I, for, for me, I think Zoom Court started during the pandemic. So if you go to a courthouse website, um, they'll have the login information, probably not Zoom for the public, but they'll have a call-in number if it's virtual and you can listen. I don't know what's happening now, but it's going to be different for every courthouse. Um, but for for outside of COVID or, you know, when things and I would call the courthouse and ask them what the accommodations are. Um, they should have accommodations of some kind. So if they don't, that's something to definitely fight about because these proceedings are supposed to be public. And when you go or when you listen in, I hope that you are so pissed off that you do something about it, that you are fire and do something you know we need you from front and so i hope that you're to, to take action and and work with us okay. well thank you everybody for coming um you can engage with our instagram page our twitter feed with our we have a facebook page i don't know um and definitely come to our event next week um, all the information will be on our Instagram page and on Twitter and our website. So have a good evening, everyone. Afternoon. <laughs>